Welcome to Tactics. It's a unique class we're offering on Wednesday nights at the Wednesday night at Shoreline Classes that have been going on for quite a while. And what's unique about this class is it's our first effort in the field of apologetics. And Tactics uh, is a class we're teaching from the work of Greg Kukul, K-O-U-K-L. So uh, if I'm you, I'm wondering, so who's this Greg Kukul and what are apologetics about? And I'm going to share that with you. So the word apologetics comes from an ancient uh, word used in the times of the Greeks and beyond, apologia. And here's what it means to us. It means it's a reasoned argument or a writing in justification of and defending something. And today, commonly a Christian doctrine. Back in the days of the Greeks, an apologia was a reasoned defense that someone would use in a court of law to uh, help a defendant, to defend them. So that's what the word means for us today. Um, so we have a verse also that we go to to kind of give us a little more understanding. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. I'm going to read it to you. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You know, the Apostle Paul was an apologist. Amongst all the other things that he did, he was, a, he was a terrific apologist. And he would often reference prophetic passages from the Old Testament as he defended and taught and supported the reality of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And in the book of Acts, you will read of Paul uh, doing um, all kinds of things to defend and justify the truth found only in Jesus Christ. So today, we have some modern apologists uh, with names that come to mind. You might recognize a few. Uh, we have Dr. William Lane Craig, uh, currently an apologist. Dr. Frank Turek, an apologist. Uh, we have Ravi Zacharias, who sadly uh, went home to be with the Lord this year. Good for him, but sad for us leader of Ravi Zacharias Ministries, world-class apologist. We have uh, C.S. Lewis. There's a very familiar name. When we think of him in apologetics, the book that comes to mind immediately is Mere Christianity, in which he gives this beautiful, wonderful uh, explanation of and defense of the gospel. And through Ravi Zacharias Ministries, we also had our own Dr. Nabil Qureshi, I say our own, because Nabil spoke at this church a number of times and was friend to many of us, and he too went home to be with the Lord a couple years ago. These are world-class apologists, so you may know one or two of them. That's apologetics, people who defend and explain the truth of Christianity and the truth found in Jesus and in the Bible. But what about this Greg Kukul guy? Um, here's what Greg uh, does. He, he's an apologist, and he does it in a very unique way. He found uh, the organization called Stand a Reason, and it's dedicated to training those who support Christianity and how to defend their faith with knowledge, wisdom, and character. Uh, he produced a weekly radio program up till 2015, and he still puts out audio podcasts, books, articles, um, does appearances on certain talk shows, uh, teaches at conferences, at leading institutions, and all of that. He has a master's degree in philosophy and a master's degree in apologetics. So I first encountered Greg when I came across a short debate on YouTube. Lee Strobel, who wrote The Case for Christ, also an excellent apologist, and someone who's appeared at Shoreline uh, once on a Sunday, twice at Organic Outreach Conferences, and as a friend of pastors, uh, Kevin, Pastor Kevin and his wife, Sherry. Lee Strobel hosts a uh, television show. And in this show, he brings folks on for about a 15-minute segment to debate each other, folks of differing viewpoints. 
Well, I came across this one, and it was Greg Kukul uh, on the side of Christianity and Dr. Deepak Chopra on the other side of just general spiritual meditation, New Age stuff. They were to have a 15-minute debate. It was so engaging and so lively, Strobel even says he backed off the requirement for a 15-minute segment and gave him the whole show. I watched it. I was transfixed. If you're not aware of Dr. Deepak Chopra, he's one of the wealthiest alternative medicine uh, promoters in the world. He has written countless books on meditation, spirituality, new age spirituality, and that would kind of be his, his niche. Uh, definitely not Christian, but embraces everything for anybody. And so he's not uh, not a Christian at all and someone that would be a great opponent <laughs> for Greg Kukul. And I, I, was, I was utterly transfixed. As Chopra shared his views of Jesus and spirituality in general, Greg countered them with accuracy, specifics, and truth. And he did it all with gentleness, respect, and grace. And by the end of the debate, it was pretty clear Chopra was completely defeated, even downcast. He just had nowhere to go. So I said, I got to find out more about this guy. I got to find out what he's written and read his stuff. And that's what I did. So we need to know, and we want to teach you exactly what did he do and how are we going to learn to do that in this class called Tactics? By the way, I've mentioned apologetics. This is the first class in the field of apologetics Shoreline will offer. But starting next year, we're going to be offering new and different apologetics classes throughout the year. It's a commitment we've made to helping people learn more about how to teach and defend our faith. So what did he do and what are we going to learn to do? Let me give you a quote from Lee Strobel. And he wrote this in the foreword of Kukul's book, Tactics. Here's what he said, commenting on the debate. You know, he wasn't belligerent or obnoxious. He didn't raise his voice or launch into a sermon. Instead, he used the kind of tactics that he describes in this book, winsomely using key questions and other techniques to guide the conversation and unveil the flawed assumptions and hidden contradictions in another person's positions. So I mentioned the Apostle Paul was an apologist as well as a great evangelist and church planner and teacher. Here's what Paul writes in Colossians chapter three or chapter four, excuse me, verse six. He says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. We are going to learn how to be diplomatic as we defend the faith with grace and respect, using great questions to connect in fruitful conversations. Kukul goes on to contend that in today's world, there are three basic skills that are required to represent Christ as an ambassador. See, an ambassador is, is the definition is someone who represents the interests of the one who sent them. For example, if the U United States has an ambassador in Iceland, that ambassador is there representing the interests of the United States. We as believers are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We represent his interests. So these three basic skills are required to do a good job as the ambassador of Jesus Christ. Number one, we need the basic knowledge. I need to know the gospel. I need to have a good idea of what's in the Bible and the flow of scripture. I need to have an idea of the gospel really means from Genesis 3 all the way through to the resurrection is one story, God's story, of redeeming his people unto himself. I need to know about the sacrifice Jesus willingly gave for all who receive him to be reconciled to God. I need to have an idea of the Old Testament, 
what's unique in the historical parts, of just a, at least a working idea. I need the knowledge of the church itself and how it grew out of the book of Acts. I need that. Then our knowledge must be tempered with wisdom. So what do we mean when we say wisdom? Well, we mean the things we've learned over time, the things we've been taught, the things we've learned through experience. And have we let the experience teach us? Have we gained insight into best courses of action, best behaviors, best ethics? That's wisdom. So we need knowledge as a skill and then wisdom as a skill. But most importantly, third skill, our character will make or break our mission, our character. I've been a counselor for over 40 years. In my private practice in the Bay Area many years ago, I worked with a number of leaders in the church, and on occasion I would encounter a leader working with me for personal painful issues who had a character as such that was off-putting, that was difficult to deal with, that was difficult to approach, that was a little harsh and abrasive. But they had some wisdom and terrific knowledge. It was breaking their mission. What they really wanted to do, believed they should do, they couldn't accomplish because the character wasn't right. It just wasn't right for the mission. So these three skills play a part in every effective involvement with a non-believer. Now, the second skill, though, tactical wisdom, will be the main focus of Kukul's material in the book, Tactics, and the main focus of our classes. So regarding tactics, there's a difference between tactics and strategy. What is the difference? Well, strategy is much more so the big picture, the large scale operation, the global view. Um, and that's us as Christians. And we actually have a superior strategy to anyone who's not a believer. Why? Why is that? We have the book of God's word. We know the end of the story. We know about eternity. We have the Holy Spirit living within. We already have it. So we have a strategic goal that we already are living in and understand and works in our life. So we're already one, one leg up in the whole conversation with a non-believer. We're already there. It's the content of our ideas that we hold in Christianity in our faith that supports this strategy. So within strategy, there's two areas we'll be looking at as we walk through the classes and two areas for you to know today. The first area is what we call offensive apologetics. Like a football team, you're on the offense, you have the ball. And that simply means you're making a positive case for Christianity. You're teaching truths. You're going forward with explaining the gospel and the reality of it. That's an offensive strategy. The second, logically, is the defensive strategy. On the defense, it means we're answering challenges to Christianity. So like in a football game, we're on defense. Now we're not moving the ball down the field. We're trying to keep the other person from getting into the end zone. We're defending our goal. We're defending Christianity when we're using defensive apologetics. But with these two approaches, offensive strategy, defensive strategy, there's something missing. There's a missing piece. What is it? Well, here's a hint. A sharp lawyer needs more than facts to make his case in court. And like a lawyer, we need a plan to artfully manage the details of the dialogues we have with others. I've been in the courtroom. I've testified. I've sat on a jury. It isn't just the facts, it's the presentation, the, the, the respect with which they're delivered, um, the openness uh, for others involved in the sharing, all those things. There's a winning way that an attorney must have. So strategy operates with tactics. So are there any dangers in using tactics? Potentially, yes, there are. Let's just list a few. 
<clears throat> Here's a few possible dangers. You might be asking questions that you've learned through our course, and somebody right away just is coming at you, all out offense. What about the ark? They've never found it. What about the golden fleece? What about, what about the God who wiped out all these people, women and children and animals? What about, what about, and what about? And what about Buddhism? And, and you're getting them rapid fire and you're just like, whoa, you're like dodging bullets. That can happen. It can throw you off guard. It could when we're using tactics. Secondly, some people may become offended and as a result, avoid any further contact. And the offense could be in just you asking sort of a, uh, an exploratory question, and we'll teach those. But you see, some people also have been wounded by church early in their life, maybe adolescent years, maybe young adulthood, but they've been wounded by things that happened in their Christian church experience. And so they may have a trigger and a question may be asked that sets them off. That could happen when you're using tactics. The third potential danger is about you or me. You might become nervous or hesitant in the asking. You might lose what Kuka would call your 10 second window to ask the question. And as a result, you might back off engaging with the person, they might lose interest, that could happen. And there might be another one. What can you think of? Fill in the blanks with maybe something that comes to mind for you that might be a potential problem or danger in using tactics. So here's something to remember, though. Tactics, as you will see, really means learning how to ask questions. These tactics, I'm going to quote from Kukul on this. We, we really need to know this. These tactics are not tricks. They're not slick ruses. We're not faking someone out. They're not clever ploys that belittle or humiliate the other person. None of that is allowed in using these tactics. Instead, tactics are used to gain a footing, to maneuver, and to expose another person's bad thinking so you can guide them to truth. Notice what I said. Not to expose someone as a bad person. That's not it at all. To expose bad thinking over time so they can see it. So it's not a trick, not a ruse, not a clever ploy. There's no belittling, demeaning, humiliating, dismissing any of that, the other person. So there's the name of the first approach we're going to teach in this very first video. And that is the Colombo tactic. And if you're my age, you remember the Lieutenant Colombo Weekly Detective Series. That's where Mr. Kukul got this tactic from Lieutenant Colombo himself. So I remember this guy. I love the show. I love that show. You got this detective with messed up hair, an unlit cigar, a rumpled trench coat, even on the hottest day. He looks totally disheveled, like he slept in his clothes. And he appears like a bumbling incompetent. And that's the way he would walk through every show. Every show. But all of this outward appearance, which would disarm people, he is no threat to anybody, covered over his skill at asking tough questions in an inoffensive way that productively advanced the conversation. So let me give you a sample of what I mean. Here's his classic trademark approach. For example, he would say something like this. Ah, I, I got a problem. Something about this thing bothers me. Maybe you can clear this up. Do you, do you mind if I ask you a question? <laughs> or number two, thank you. He's asked the question and answered it. Thank you, thank you. You're a very intelligent person. I could see that. Just uh, one more thing. <laughs> and then number three, he would often say this. I'm sorry. I'm making a pass to myself. You know, it's because I keep asking these questions. I can't help it. It's a habit. Well, this is a habit we want to build, isn't it? 
We want to build this habit in growing and using tactics. So here's some other keys, and we'll come back to all of this as we walk through these classes. Here's a key. When you're using tactics, if you hit a roadblock, you ask a question. You don't stop. You don't put it in reverse. You ask a question. We'll teach you how to do that. Here's another key. Never make an assertion when a question can make the same point. Meaning what? I have to resist the urge to say, well, this is how it is. And think to myself, how can I ask a question that draws this out? Never make an assertion when a question can make the same point. And here's some tremendous advantages of asking questions. Questions are interactive. They invite others to join in. See, what I'm doing now doesn't. You're watching this video. You're going to watch four more videos for the four classes after this. And I'm not drawing you in in a conversation. I'm talking to you. Questions are interactive. They invite the other person in. And then a question helps you make headway without requiring you to state your case. You're making headway. You're going further into the conversation and you're not yet having to make your case. Next, questions shift the burden of proof to the other person. Questions shift the burden of proof to the other person. And then questions allow you to pursue friendly conversations and avoid unnecessary conflict. So this, so this game plan of using Columbo tactic puts you in the driver's seat. That's what this is designed to do. So I mentioned game plan. What, what's the game plan? What do we mean? We're going to learn how to do the Columbo tactic. That's the first thing we'll learn as we walk through this time together in the classes that come. See, the Colombo tactic offers excellent starters for conversation. It's interactive by nature. It's neutral. It helps you get started without making your case. It buys you valuable time and it keeps you in the driver's seat. So are there any reservations? You might have, I might have, or even Kukul in writing this has. Yeah, there's a few. We got to explore them. Let's take a look at them. Number one, having these types of conversations can get close to arguing. Is arguing bad? Maybe. If you get angry in an argument, and I know this by being a marriage counselor. If you get angry in the argument, good outcome is rarely the result. Squabbling, bickering, yelling, making faces are not very attractive, and they often inspire defensiveness. And we know from the Gottman studies on relationships and couples and communication, defensiveness is a couple killer. So we're not going to do things that inspire defensiveness in someone as we use these tactics in our game plan. So number two, this is an important rule. I'll revisit this repeatedly. And you can apply this rule in conflicts in your life outside of using tactics too. If anyone in the discussion gets angry, you lose. And we say it this way because what if it's the other? I'm not angry. How do I lose? Well, they're on defense now. The blocks come up. The resistance heightens. It's not working. So if anyone in the discussion gets angry, you lose. So I'm going to quote him here. He has a great quote, and I appreciate how he puts this. Always make it a goal to keep your conversation cordial. Sometimes that will not be possible. If a principled, charitable expression of your ideas makes someone mad, there's little you can do about it. Jesus' teaching made some people furious. Just make sure it's your ideas that offend and not you. 
that your beliefs caused the dispute and not your behavior. That's if you get in a argument style discussion. Number three, <coughs> excuse me. Keeping your cool gives these tactics their very best shot. Stay cool under fire. Stay cool. You have the very best possibility that they'll be effective. And next, some people, Christians, fear division. They do. Any disagreement, oh no, we don't see this eye to eye. If you're talking to another believer or even someone who's yet to be a believer, if we're in disagreement, that's divisive. That's division. We all need to be happily in agreement about everything. That could be something that causes a reservation to engage. And number five, and there's more than five. We're just giving you five. Some believers are reactive. I have friends like this. And I think I've been this before. Any opposition to their beliefs are fighting words. Oh, yeah, you're wrong, and off we go. And the goal that we wanted to set is gone, right? It just disappears. But are arguments in themselves bad? Not really. The, the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. It doesn't mean you can't be aroused, you know, kind of riled up in a discussion, but do not sin. And the cooler you can stay, the more effective you'll be. So arguments aren't in and of themselves bad. Love and arguments. Love and crafting a position. Love and doing using tactics can all help God do his work. You see, without God's work, nothing else works. But with his work, many things work. So scripture tells us that I don't, I don't lead someone to Christ. The Holy Spirit does. I'm called to lay the groundwork. I'm called to plant the seeds. I'm called to tell the truth. But none come to the Father, but the Holy Spirit draws them. I need to know that. Love and arguments can work. But if God's not in it, it's not going to happen. If he is in it, it's going to happen. So acts of love and good arguments both work, but only work because of what we can't do and only he can do. But if he's doing it, it will happen. And we will be the gardeners who've helped along the way. That's who we'll be. So let's, let's set a goal. Here's the modest goal. Catch this, a modest goal. Kukul gives us this goal, and I like it. What are the principles of tactics? This is going to help us get to our goal. What are the principles? What's the method and why? Well, here we are. We are gardeners, not harvesters. In general, here's what I mean. Pastor Howie, who founded Shoreline Church, is a harvester. He's a gardener also, but what a gifted harvester, meaning what? A gifted evangelist and gifted at altar calls, gifted at leading people to Jesus. Loves it, would do it whenever he could, was fully engaged, fully at home in doing it. Pastor Kevin, Shoreline's pastor today, is exactly the same. Completely gifted in evangelism, totally committed to it. He's comfortable doing an altar call, loves doing it. People sense it, and they come and give their lives to Christ. I don't have the gift. I did a couple of uh, awkward altar calls years ago preaching at Shoreline, and it became very clear, oh, man, it's not my gift. But I'm like you in another regard. I have gifts. So do you. If you've invited Jesus into your heart, you have spiritual gifts. If you don't know what they are, take the Shoreline Spiritual Gifts Assessment. But anyway, I'm, I'm a gardener. And what does a gardener do? Prepares the soil, sets up a water system, plants seeds, does all the work it takes. We had scattering seeds as a theme of a, an organic outreach conference that we held here a few years back. And the whole idea there was the same thing. Just scatter the seed. We're gardeners. Kuko believes he's a gardener not a harvester. And by that, it means we don't have to hit home runs. I don't even have to get a double or a single. I just need to get into the 
batter's box. I need to be up to bat. And I get up to bat by learning various techniques that use questions to get up to bat. So I'm going to give you a taste of these questions. I'm going to give you two of my favorites as we do our game plan and develop it one by one using the Colombo technique. Here's two questions. Here's the first question. What do you mean by that? Very simple. What do you mean by that? This question I might use if I'm talking to my step cousin who says, well, we really believe the cosmos watches over us all, the cosmos. So I would say to them, oh, okay, wow, interesting. So, so what do you, what do you, what all do you mean by that? I'd like to understand it better. I'm drawing them out. And now they're going to likely, because I'm doing it with respect, start to put out some pieces of what they think on the table. Well, here's what it means. Here's why we think it. Here's how it works. Something. So what do you mean by that? Or if someone says, I don't think God cares about anybody. I might say, well, what do you mean by that? And when you say God, what do you mean? Well, what are you thinking of? Just simple questions. What do you mean by that? Or some form of, what do you mean by that? Now, say I'm talking to that step cousin and they give me 15 minutes of their philosophy, spiritual take on the cosmos watching over us all. When they're done, here's my next question. I'm really curious. How did you get there? How did you come to this understanding, this conclusion? Can you just tell me, how, what was the journey like? How did you come to that conclusion or some form of that? So these first two questions, what do you mean by that? And how do you come to that conclusion? So you see, I'm drawing them out. I'm humbly and respectfully inviting them to share what they think and why they think it. I don't have to accuse them, attack them, or probe for anything. These simple questions, just like Columbo, draw someone else out and put their material out where we can see it and look at it. So Kuka would say, he's not trying to convince someone in the moment. He's not trying to close the deal. He's not saying, hey, they got to accept Jesus now. I got to figure this out. I got to do it. I got to stay on it. That's not his calling. I mean, I'm sure it's happened at some point in his life, but he's clear it's not his calling, and it isn't mine in the way that it's Pastor Howie's and Pastor Kevin's. What he's trying to do, and you got to hear this, here it is. Kukul's trying to put a stone in their shoe. That's all he's trying to do, a stone in their shoe. Here's what he says. I want to quote him. He puts it... Uh, puts it clearly. He says, I encourage you to consider the strategy I use when God opens a door of opportunity in me. I pray quickly for wisdom, then ask myself this question. And you can ask yourself this question as well. What one thing can I ask? What seed can I plant that will get the other person thinking? Then I simply try to put a stone in the other person's shoe. So our encouragement to you is to adopt that same stance. Avoid focusing on getting the other person to the cross, on their knees, and giving up to Jesus in every encounter. Just aim to put a stone in their shoe. Give them something to think about. Plant a seed that God can grow into something great. And when you learn these tactics and you practice them, and we'll give you plenty of opportunity in the classes ahead, you'll find them more and more natural, more and more workable for you. Uh, they'll flow rather than you have to try to remember. And when you do it in an inoffensive way, you do it as Lieutenant Columbo would humbly ask questions. But underneath have tactics he's using, fitting the overall strategy. You'll have the same impact. Anyone can do this. You can do this. 
We're just going to learn it as we go. And hopefully this will help many of you who maybe to this point in time have thought, well, I can't ever be an apologist. I can't ever be that person that draws someone out into a discussion of Christianity or their faith. I, I've tried it. I don't have it. It feels weird. It feels awkward. I, I don't even know where to start. You do now. Start with this class. Start with tactics. So I encourage you to walk along with us in the weeks ahead. You're going to have four additional videos to view, all available to you. Here's our plan. You watch the video ahead of time. And then uh, we'll promote the dates of the classes when they occur. Then you come online live, and I and another will be there to share questions with you that will be available. We'll put them online and you can download them and print them out. And we'll together walk through answering these questions to help us remember what we've, we're learning and to help us remember uh, week by week a little better how to put it into action. So I'm very excited to have you with us in our first ever class on apologetics. We're teaching tactics. And I'm excited to have you in the weeks ahead. If you know anyone else that might want to take this journey with us, please let them know. Let them know how to do it. And in this video, also and online, we'll show you a workbook we'd encourage you to buy by Kukul and how to get it to use as we go along week to week. Until then, until next week, let's start thinking about those great questions as we do our Columbo and start some exciting conversations with others. God bless. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, please visit our Wednesday Night at Shoreline online page on our website and click Join Discussion for the Tactics class. We'll be digging deeper into the truths we've just heard and spend some time in fellowship and prayer. See you there.